Good morning, people of God. Welcome to worship. I'm Jay Hilbinger, one of the pastors here at First Lutheran Church. It's good to, good to be together this morning. And whether you are taking part live now as this is being streamed online or joining us later by recording, it's good to be together and thank you for your presence. Please take a moment on Facebook to greet one another by making a comment let us know you're here, and also tell us where you're worshiping from today. We'd appreciate that. And let me share a few announcements as we begin this morning. First of all, we will celebrate Holy Communion as part of our worship this morning. So if you haven't already done so, you may want to take a moment to get your bread or crackers and your wine or juice ready to participate at home, wherever you find yourselves this morning. And we'll do that later on in the worship service. Also, our weekly e-news is our primary way of communicating right now. And it lists lots of ways we continue to serve our neighbors, especially those dealing with unemployment and those dealing with food insecurity. So in addition to those things, there are several Bible studies going on and a book study as well that's getting ready to start. And we invite you to get our e-news and participate. So if you aren't getting our e-news, please let the church office know. And you can send us a private message by way of the Facebook page as well if you'd like to do that. Get on our email list for that. Make sure you have Sunday, October 4th on your calendars. From noon until 2, we will host a drive-through flu shot clinic in our parking lot. And from noon until 5, we will host the Big Red Bus from OneBlood.org for a blood drive. More details are in the e-news, including ways you can make reservations and get your spot. Last thing, a worship note for next Sunday. Next Sunday at both morning worship times, we are going to celebrate Music Sunday and give thanks for the musicians in our midst. We will have more music and no sermons. So I see you smiling out there. Uh, as we do that, I uh, want you to know at 11 a.m. traditional, they, that will feature the debut of our First Lutheran Church virtual choir. All First Lutheran members who have recorded their voices singing at home and then it's been compiled by our music staff and it really is sounding amazing. So thanks for doing that and please tune in next Sunday for that. We continue our worship this morning with the brief order for confession and forgiveness. Join with me as we remember God's presence in our midst. Praise and thanks to God, Creator, Lord, and Companion, eternal source of forgiveness, mercy, and grace. Amen. Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Awaken us to the power of your Holy Spirit, that we may receive your forgiveness, confess our sin, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. Gracious God, we humbly acknowledge before you and one another that we have turned from your ways and we have struggled with the power of sin by what we have done and by what we have failed to do. We, we turn, turn to, to you and wish to do better. We, we trust, trust in your compassion as you promise to forgive us. As we renew our promise to follow Christ as our Lord, uphold us by your Spirit, so we may live and serve you in newness of life. Amen. Hear the good news. God is rich in mercy, loves us even when we give in to sin, and makes us alive in union with Christ. By grace we are made whole. In the name of Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven. May Almighty God strengthen us with the power of the Holy Spirit, so faithfulness to Christ may be our guide. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you.
As we gather at your table, as we listen to your word, help us know, God, your presence. Let our hearts and minds be stirred. Nourish us with sacred story till we claim it as our own. Teach us through this holy banquet how to make love's victory known. Turn our worship into witness in the sacrament of life. Send us forth to love and serve you, bringing peace where there is strife. Give us, Christ, your great compassion to forgive as you forgave. May we still be on your image in the world you died to save. Gracious Spirit, help us summon other guests to share that feast. Where triumphant love will welcome those who had been last and least. There no more will envy blind us, nor will pride our peace destroy. As we join with saints and angels to repeat the sounding joy. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And, and also, also with, with you. pray. God of creation, you are the source of all our human power and authority. Guide us by your spirit and help us to see the world and our neighbors through your eyes of grace. Teach, Teach us to use our, our gifts wisely as, as vessels of your compassion, your forgiveness, and your justice. 
For the sake of Jesus Christ and his mission, we pray. We pray. Amen. Amen. I'd like to invite the younger ones to come a little closer and participate in this part of the service. It's good to spend some time together with you and know that you are missed terribly. We can't wait until the time when we can get back together again in person. Today, what I'd like to ask you are some simple questions about your parents and the other adults in your life who care about you. First question is an obvious one. Do they love you? Of course they do. But how do you know that? How do you know that you are loved? Hopefully they tell you that, right? Hopefully they say on occasion, I love you. I care about you. I'm here for you. You can tell me that. You can talk to me. How can I help you? With words, we express love and care. Jesus did that all the time. But how else do you know that you are loved? Because beyond words, sometimes we need more than words, and that's by how people show us that they care. They show us that they care by their actions, not just their words. Parents and other caring adults do that by hugging us, by kissing us, by holding our hand, by feeding us, by clothing us, and by just taking care of us and doing things with us and doing things for us that we need them to do. It's how they show us that they love us beyond the words. There's a saying that Jesus was familiar with, and sometimes we use it today as well. He tells a story in our Bible reading for today from Matthew's Gospel. And it goes like this. The phrase is, actions speak louder than words. Actions speak louder than words. Have you ever heard that? I bet you know what that means. I might say that I will do something, but just saying the words doesn't mean it gets done, right? If your parents ask you to help with the dishes after dinner or clean up your room or finish your schoolwork, you can say, okay, I'll do that, but that doesn't mean it's done. Of course, you actually have to do the thing that they ask you to do. And why? Because they love you and you love them. And that's how families work. Actions speak louder than words. Sometimes love needs more than just words to be felt, to be experienced, to be shared. Well, that's why we share this meal. This meal we get together as a family to share, and right now we're doing it online. We're doing it virtually in a different kind of gathering, right? And we have wine or grape juice and bread, and we share what we call Holy Communion or the Lord's Supper. Because Jesus did not just say God loves us, he did that all the time, but he also showed us with his actions. That God loves us, that God forgives us, that God is always with us, that God will never leave us, and that God claims us as God's children. Jesus used a lot of actions to go with those words. And when we eat this bread and when we share this wine and grape juice, it is Jesus sharing God's actions that speak louder than just words alone. We don't just hear God saying to us, I love you. You're my child. We can taste it. We can smell it. We can feel it and hold it in our hands. We can chew it and swallow it and drink it. That's what makes this sharing of bread and wine and grape juice so important in our lives. God's love for you, God's love for me, is giving life to us all the time. And we can experience it because God shows us. We don't just hear it. Please talk about the reading with your families this week, and let's conclude with prayer. 
Good and gracious God, thank you for Jesus who didn't just use words but also showed us how much you love us. Help us, O oh God, to do the same. Thank you for this meal of bread and wine and juice and the way it reminds us that you show us your love so that we can feel it and taste it and touch it. And you remind us to share your love also, not just with words, but with actions. We love you, God, and we thank you. Amen. The reading is from the 17th chapter of Exodus. From the wilderness of sin, the whole congregation of the Israelites journeyed by stages as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. The people quarreled with Moses and said, give us water to drink. Moses said to them, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water, and the people complained against Moses and said, why do you bring us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, what shall I do with this people? They are most ready to stone me. The Lord said to Moses, go on ahead of the people and take some of the elders of Israel with you, taking your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I will be standing there in front of you on the rock of Horeb. Strike the rock and water will come out of it so the people may drink. Moses did so in sight of the elders of Israel. He called the place Massa and Meribah because the Israelites quarreled and tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? Here ends the lesson. Our psalm today is Psalm 25, and we're reading from Nan Merrill's book, Psalms for Praying. To you, O love, I lift up my soul. O heart within my heart, in you I place my trust. Let me not feel unworthy. Let not fear rule over me. Yes, may all who open their hearts savor you and bless the earth. Compel me to know your ways, O love. Instruct me upon your paths. Lead me in your truth. And teach me, for through you will I know wholeness. I shall reflect your light both day and night. I know of your mercy, blessed one, and of your unconditional love. You have been with me from the beginning. Forgive the many times I have walked away from you, choosing to follow my own will. I seek your guidance. Once again, I yearn to know your peace. Companion me as I open to your will. You are gracious and just, O Spirit of truth, happy to guide those who miss their way. You enjoy teaching all who are open, all who choose to live in truth. Here ends the reading. The reading is from the third chapter of Philippians. Even though I too have reason for confidence in the flesh, if anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Yet whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as lost because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as lost because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death, if somehow I may obtain resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made it his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. Here ends the lesson.
a reading from Matthew, the 21st chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus entered the temple and was teaching. Some religious leaders and elders approached him and asked, By what authority are you doing these things? Who gave you this authority? Jesus said, Let me ask you a question first. If you can answer mine, then I will answer yours. Did the baptism of John come from God, or was it of human origin? They argued with one another. If we say from God, he will say to us, then why did you not believe him? But if we say of human origin, we're afraid of the crowds, for they regard John as a prophet. So they answered him, we do not know. With that, Jesus replied, Neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. Jesus continued, What do you think about this story? A man had two sons. He went to the first son, saying, Son, go work in the vineyard today. The son replied, No, I will not. But later he changed his mind and went. The father went to the second son and made the same request. The son answered, Yes, sir, I will do that. But he never went. So which of these two did the will of their father? They answered, The first, of course. Jesus replied, Yes. And do you realize that thieves and prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you? John showed everyone the way of righteousness, and you chose not to believe him. But thieves and prostitutes believed his message. Even after you saw their response, you did not change your minds. The good news of God for all people. Praise Praise to you, O Christ. I want to share a story, something that happened early in my ordained ministry as a pastor. I believe it was during my second year as a pastor. I was serving a church in Columbia, South Carolina, and I remember because it was the first time I got to preach on Reformation Sunday. Reformation Sunday is, of course, a big deal for most Lutherans. I wanted to find the perfect illustration to demonstrate what a risk Martin Luther had taken during the 1500s, as he confronted the church teachings of his time, as he attempted to assert the concept of God's grace as God's primary mode of operation. Luther was throwing caution to the wind. He was confronting the highest authority and advocating for a drastic change in the core teachings of the church and the practices as well. Well, to do that, I used a very popular television commercial from Burger King at the time, the one with the slogan that says, sometimes you got to break the rules. The common ground, I thought, was that Burger King liked to assert that they were the only chain at the time that would grill burgers over an open flame, and they were the only fast food restaurant that would custom make your hamburger the way you liked it. They claimed they were breaking all the rules of how burgers were supposed to be made, and it was outside of the box. I thought it was the perfect illustration because Luther's thinking was definitely outside of the norms of his day. And these proposals during the Reformation era were a different way of seeing God and a life of faith. So I thought, that's it. That's perfect. That's what I want people to grasp. I thought that until the following Sunday. The very next Sunday, a week later, a young mother in the congregation came to me to tell me something that had happened in her home that week. Mom came down, as usual, to help her daughter get breakfast. 
but her daughter was already sitting at the table eating breakfast. She had fixed breakfast for herself, which was very unusual. And no kidding, she had a bowl in front of her and she was eating away. But when her mother looked, it wasn't what was usually in that bowl. In the bowl were three scoops of ice cream and half a bottle of chocolate syrup. And mom, of course, asked her daughter with just a slight note of judgment, perhaps, what are you doing? We don't eat ice cream for breakfast. To which the smiling four-year-old girl replied, Pastor Jay said sometimes you got to break the rules. <laughs> and that's a true story, I kid you not. The mom shared with me the next Sunday that she was very proud of her daughter for listening and paying attention during worship, including my sermon. But of course, she wasn't sure that her daughter understood the implications for the history of the Reformation. It was an important lesson for me to better understand the power of words and the power of what it is I do in my chosen vocation. When I write sermons and think about what I should say and how to say it, more than a few times I have gone back to that moment and thought through what it is I'm saying. In our Bible story today from the 21st chapter of Matthew, the religious authorities uh, of Jesus' day are questioning Jesus' own authority and where it comes from. They want to put him in his place, it sounds like. What Jesus does is try to get them to understand something and see something differently. That they are using their power and their own authority of position in a way that causes harm instead of good. And in a way that is self-serving instead of blessing others. Jesus tells those religious authorities a story as he attempts to get them to be more introspective, to reflect on what it is they're doing and what's behind it all. Jesus is trying to get those leaders to reflect on where their own authority and power comes from. God, of course. And then he tries to get them to think about using all of it for God's purposes. Instead of using it in a way that builds them up at the expense of someone else, as they choose to either judge or exclude people or talk about who's in and who's out. I would offer to you that one of the greatest values of this reading and this story for us, among several things, is to first reflect on what gifts do you have? What abilities are special or unique to you? What do other people see in you that you do well? What talents and strengths and gifts has God given us? And secondly, then, to prayerfully contemplate and give some attention to, are we using them to the best of God's desire and God's ability? Let me close with, Two quotes and two conversations that happened just this past week. The first quote is from author and activist Alice Walker. She said, the most common way people give up their power is by thinking they don't have any. Think about that. The most common way people give up their power is by thinking they don't have any. If we are people of faith, we trust that there's a power associated with that, that we are created in God's very own image, that the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, is what animates us, energizes us, and gives us life, and that God, however we understand God in our own journeys, is continuing to create and heal and bless and bring wholeness to all of creation. That God needs and wants to do that through each of our bodies and our lives and our gifts and our resources and our abilities. 
So as you consider the gifts and abilities and the power that you have, please keep those indisputable tenets of being a person of faith and a child of God in heart and in mind. Yesterday, I had a chance to encounter uh, someone, a woman from the neighborhood who was passing by our building after she had been to the grocery store. She knew that we were collecting certain things for families in need in our community. And she went to the grocery store and happened to pass through the aisle with diapers for babies and young children. And she noticed the price and said, oh my goodness, I had no idea they were that expensive. It's been a long time since I've purchased any. And so she bought several packs of diapers to bring and drop off for uh, Faith Action International House that we're collecting that are helping families primarily who had jobs in food service and right now are unemployed. And they're struggling to pay the rent and put food on the table and they're not getting paychecks as they normally used to do. So she brought those and she just said, are you going to use these locally? And I explained to her what Faith Action International House is doing and how we partner with them. And she left with a smile on her face and I assured her that families would be blessed and grateful. Well, another quote I'll share with you. Many of you have heard the name Leo Buscalia. Leo Buscalia was a prolific author and a researcher on the topic of love. He once said this, too often we underestimate the power of a touch or a smile or a kind word or a listening ear or an honest compliment or the smallest act of caring, all of which have the potential to turn a life around. I got an email this week from one of our First Lutheran Church chaplains who have been trained to assist the pastors in caring for the congregation, especially being in touch with and walking with members who have recently been hospitalized or had surgery or been ill or dealing with illness or are grieving. The email went like this. After multiple attempts, I finally got connected with one of our members that I was trying to reach. We had a 40-minute conversation. We prayed together and we talked about our common joint replacement surgeries that we've had. I learned that this member was also treated for cancer several years ago. And so we talked about that as well, having that in common since I'm going through that myself. I will try to have further conversation and connection with this person moving forward. And the chaplain concluded with these words, gosh, the call was great. Another reason why being a chaplain for the congregation blesses me as much as the people I hope to help and to call. So a simple couple of questions to take into the week. What sort of power and authority has God invested in you and in me? Those gifts, those strengths, those abilities, those talents, those resources that we have to share. How has God invested in you? And how can each of us give God the best return on God's investment as we go about the week ahead? In Jesus' name, amen. We respond to God and the good news in our midst by professing our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. Together we say, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, 
the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. It is that time in the worship service when we think about how God has richly blessed us and how we might share God's blessings with the world. So I encourage you and ask you to continue supporting the mission and ministry of First Lutheran Church with your gifts, to also think about ways you can continue to be blessing and healing others in our community through the church and beyond. And I ask you to also just think about your gifts and your sphere of influence and how you might be God's presence and love for someone this week. with me as we pray. Drawn together in the compassion of God, we pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. Good and gracious God, the words of Jesus give us comfort, guidance, and strength. And yet we realize his actions speak even more loudly. Thank you for our Lord and teacher Jesus, who valued demonstrative love as his priority and as his life purpose. May we continue to learn to do the same. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, you've given each of us unique gifts and abilities. Indeed, they are expressions of your creative and life-giving power within us. May we choose wisely how we use these gifts and offer them to you as a way to heal and bless the world according to your desire. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For those who are suffering from wildfires and floods, we pray. For people dealing with inadequate housing and food insecurity, we pray. For those grieving the loss of loved ones, and for those for whom death draws near, we pray. For everyone in our current generations who bear the burdens of centuries of racial inequity, including slavery and genocide, we pray. Raise up among us and within us, Lord God, the determination to bring healing and peace to your world using all our gifts for you, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Gracious God, we lift before you and hold in our hearts those we wish to pray for this day, those whose names and needs are known to us. So we thank you for loved ones who have recently died, including Fridia, as we pray for her family as they grieve. We celebrate with Jeffrey and Polly the birth of a daughter, Virginia. And we celebrate with grandparents, Pam and Dale, as well. We celebrate with Caitlin and Jake as they exchange marriage vows this afternoon. And we pray for those who are in need of comfort and healing and the presence of your grace in their daily lives. We pray for Christine and Cheryl, Matt, Sarah, Howard, Evelyn, John, Myla, Catherine, Bob, John, Marin, Grace, Mary Ellen, Eric, Becky, 
B, Larry, Diana, Julius, Dorothy, Christian, Brad, and Earl. We take a moment, O oh God, to name before you either silently aloud or aloud others who are on our hearts this day. Use us, O oh God, as signs of your presence and workers of your compassion. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. All these things and whatever else you see that we need, we entrust to your care through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us prepare for the celebration of Holy Communion together this morning. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, betrayed, took bread and gave thanks. He broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body that is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup and gave thanks. He shared it with all of them, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's life, death, and resurrection as the foundation of our lives. Together we pray. Our, our Father, Father, who art, art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give, give us this day our daily bread and, and forgive, forgive us our trespasses, trespasses as, as we, we forgive, forgive those who trespass against us. And lead, lead us not into temptation, but, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and, and the glory forever and ever. ever. Amen. Amen. Hear this promise as we receive the gifts of God's table, the body of Christ given for you, the blood of Christ shed for you. Amen. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Grant us peace. May the risen presence of our Lord Jesus Christ 
and the life-giving love of Almighty God, our Creator, strengthen you and keep you in God's grace now and forever. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you with grace and with mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. With Christ and go as Christ to love and serve God's world. Thanks be to God. Yes, sir.